Okay, Appendix B is about using power series to approximate solutions of differential equations. So we need to take a step back and just remind ourselves what a power series is. This is something that you probably haven't looked at a whole lot since your second semester calculus course. Now, some of you might be experiencing a knot in your stomach at this moment because you might remember that the chapter on sequences and series was one of the more challenging sections in second semester calculus. You probably haven't looked at that in at least a semester, and so it might feel a little intimidating to suddenly have it thrown at you right at the end of this semester. Relax. I agree that the chapter on sequences and series in second semester calculus is one of the things that makes that a difficult class. But one of the most challenging things in that chapter is figuring out all of your convergence tests. How do you know when a series converges? And if it converges, does it converge to the thing you want it to converge to? That's what makes things hard. And that's not something that we're going to need to worry about this semester. I'll address that issue a little bit later on, but for now, just relax. Let's just remind ourselves what a power series is. Okay, so a power series in T would just be an infinite sum. The sum is n goes from 0 to infinity, a sub n, that's just my nth coefficient, of t to the n. So it's an infinite sum of multiples of non-negative powers of t. Of course, if n is 0, t to the 0 would just be 1, so that's going to give me a constant term. And then I'm going to have some t's, some t squared, some t cubed, and we just keep going. So it's almost like an infinite polynomial, except that technically that's a misnomer, because by definition, a polynomial is a finite sum. So if I replaced this infinity with some finite number, which was the biggest power of t that occurred in my sum, I would have a polynomial. When I have infinity here, now it's a power series. <laughs> Sometimes we choose to work with a power series in t minus t naught. I'm sorry. Yeah, in t minus t naught. That would just be the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity, a sub n. Instead of powers of t, I look at powers of t naught. We tend to do this when we're using our series to represent a function, and we're concerned with the behavior of the function at and near the point t naught. So then we work with that. Okay. Now, if we have a Taylor series for a function f of t, and if that series is centered at t naught, all that that means is that these coefficients are going to have a specific formula, that these coefficients are going to be calculated by gathering various pieces of information about our function. So this would be the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity. I'm going to have my coefficients, which will have a specific formula, and it's still just powers of t minus t naught. The coefficients are going to be a fraction what goes on the top is the nth derivative of our function evaluated at our special point at t naught. Remember that when I put that superscript in parentheses like that, that's not an exponent. That's telling me the degree of the derivative that I'm working with. So when n is 1, this would just be f prime, or the first derivative. And we interpret the zeroth derivative to simply be our function. So the zeroth derivative of f is just f itself. Okay. And then we divide by n factorial. So we have this special formula for our coefficients. And when we have that, we say that this is the Taylor series for our function f of t. As long as f is infinitely differentiable, we can form this for any function that's infinitely differentiable. But what's very special is when this series is actually equal to the function value on i, where i would be our interval of convergence. Okay. So if this series is a convergent series, 
and if it converges to the right thing, which would be the function value, then we can say that the Taylor series is actually equal to the function. And sometimes that's true everywhere, but sometimes that's just true on some interval, and it would be an interval that's centered at our special point, centered at t naught, and we call that interval the interval of convergence. That's a really nifty thing, and that can be useful because some functions have formulas that are kind of messy to work with, but power series are just sums of powers of t. Those are relatively easy to manipulate, so that can be fairly useful. Okay. Now, when we work with series, we often work with series by working with their partial sums. If I take a partial sum, I would stop at some point. Now, since I'm using n as my index here, I don't want to say n is my stopping point, so I'm going to use k as my stopping point. So the case Taylor polynomial for f of t centered at t naught. And although this semester we're not really going to be concerning ourselves with issues of convergence, the reason we say that it's centered at t naught is because the interval of convergence will have t naught as its center point. Okay. All right, this I could write as just p sub k of t, and it would just be the sum as n goes from 0 to k of my coefficients times t minus t naught to the nth, where, of course, my coefficients are given by that formula the nth derivative at t naught divided by n factorial. Okay. And the basic idea is that p sub k of t is approximately f of t, that I can use this polynomial, and polynomials are easy to work with, to approximate my function. And that's generally going to be true near t naught. I'm hoping that it's true everywhere, but probably in particular true near t naught. Okay. So if I have a power series, its partial sum actually just gives me a polynomial, and I can call that my Taylor polynomial. Now, I mentioned that we're going to be working with Maclaurin series and Maclaurin polynomials. All that that does is that makes a very simple choice for what our value t naught will be picks the easiest number we have to work with, which would be zero. Okay. So, the Maclaurin series for a function that's infinitely differentiable is just the Taylor series when t naught is chosen to be zero. Okay. So it would be the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity. I'm going to have my coefficients. They're just going to be powers now of t, because t minus t naught becomes t minus 0. So much simpler, just powers of t. And then my coefficients would be the nth derivative. I'm evaluating them all at 0 over n factorial. Okay. And again, if this series converges, and if it converges to the right thing, this power series would be equal to my function on some interval i, which would be the interval of convergence. All right, excellent. And then I can also talk about p sub k of t, which would be the case Maclaurin polynomial and that would just be the sum as n goes from 0 to k so I have a finite stopping point of my nth derivative at 0 over n factorial times t to the n. Okay and again our hope is that p sub k of t will be approximately the same as f of t. Okay. Now, when you studied these power series in second semester calculus, you spent an awful lot of time figuring out what series converged, 
if they converged, where did they converge? What was this interval of convergence? Was it all real numbers or was it some finite subinterval? You also had to check if it converged. Did it converge to the right thing? If I've got a series and I'm wanting it to represent e to the t, it had better converge to e squared when I plug in 2. So we had to check that. Okay. If we don't concern ourselves with issues of convergence, but we just sort of cross our fingers and hope <laughs> that our series will converge to our function so that our polynomial will approximate the function, we call that a formal analysis. So for a formal analysis, kind of weird. We call it a formal analysis, but it's a little bit informal because we just ignore issues of convergence. Now, it's important that we acknowledge that, that we're not checking that our power series actually do converge to the function and that our Taylor, our um, polynomials are approximately our function. We're just kind of hoping that we can approximate a solution that way. Okay. Now, that means it's not guaranteed to work. So when it's important, we might want to check. If we're trying to approximate a real uh, world situation, we might want to compare the data we get from our approximation to the data that we collect in the real world. And as long as it seems close, then this method seems to be working. If it stops being close, this method isn't working so well. Sometimes you might actually decide, okay, the formal analysis gave me an educated guess. Now I need to actually go through and check for convergence. We won't be doing that this semester. This semester, we're just going to be acknowledging that we're making some educated guesses. Okay, because that's really what we've been doing all semester, isn't it? When we get a new situation, we're like, what do you think we should do to solve this equation? Oh, let's just guess. So we've been doing a lot of that. We're going to continue doing an awful lot of that. Okay. So I want to just point out one reason that, at least for the sorts of differential equations we're, we've been encountering this semester, this is a reasonable thing to do, to not be too concerned with issues of convergence, is that if you think about the sorts of functions that we've been working with this semester, we've seen a lot of exponential functions. We've seen a lot of trig functions, sine and cosine in particular, not the other ones, but just sines and cosines. And sometimes we've seen some polynomials. Well, a polynomial is its own power series, and it always converges to itself. Okay? And the Maclaurin series for e to the x and the Maclaurin series for sine x and cosine x converge to the function on an interval of convergence that's negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay. And then if I wanted to create something like sine of 3t, it's very easy to manipulate the Maclaurin series for sine of t to get a series that represents sine of 3t. So the functions that we tend to work with the most often, at least for the differential equations that we've encountered this semester, are ones that have a convergent Maclaurin series that converges everywhere. Okay. I also want to just take a look at the first couple of coefficients. So if I say, let's say pk of t, which is the kth polynomial, so that would be the sum as n goes from 0 to k, of f to the nth at 0, not to the nth, the nth derivative at 0 over n factorial over t to the n, notice that's going to just be, if this is my a sub n, I can say, okay, that's a naught plus a1 t plus a2 t squared plus, 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 all the way down to a k t to the k. Okay. I like to use summation notation. The book tends to write things out a lot using just the dot, dot, dots. It's really up to you. You're welcome to use the summation notation. You're welcome to use the dot, dot, dots and write things out one term at a time. I'm going to sort of go back and forth between the two. There are times when this is going to be very helpful. There are times when this is a little bit more concise. Okay, but if I take a look at this, a sub 0, that's my constant term. The formula for that is that it's the 0th derivative at 0 divided by 0 factorial. 
Now remember, the zero with derivative just means the function. So that would be our function at zero. Now if I didn't have that explanation mark here saying that this was zero factorial, this would be a huge no-no because I can't divide by zero. But I can divide by zero factorial because zero factorial is just one. So the constant term is always just going to be my function evaluated at zero. Okay. And if I look at the linear coefficient, a1, a1 would be my first derivative at zero divided by one factorial. And that's actually just f prime at zero because one factorial is just one. So a1 is f prime at zero. That's important to recognize because if we have an initial value problem, very often we're given the initial function, the value of the function at zero, and the value of the derivative at zero if it's a second order equation and our initial condition has to actually be two pieces of information. So really important to recognize that those first two coefficients are actually always just the function at zero and the first derivative at zero. All right, we'll take a look at this some more in the next video.